we go. Uh, I love that old fashioned kind of like um, holding voice. Okay, so we'll get started then. So um, thank you very much for coming. Um, we, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, my name is Richard and I work with Outlandish and we essentially do a lot of um, nice tech projects for nice people. So we work with a lot of social impact organizations. We work with a lot of charities. We do work with some um, for-profit and commercial uh, bodies as well, but they all tend to have a positive um, uh, intention to change the world. So it's really, really good. Um, we are also a worker owned cooperative. So here we are. So this is a few of us. Um, a worker co owned cooperative basically means that um, we are uh, the people who do the work also own the company, which is fantastic. And I cannot recommend uh, being or joining a cooperative enough. It's absolutely fantastic. It's really, really productive. And if you want to do innovative things, the governance structure and uh, the setup and the, um, the principles and the values that you adhere to um, uh, really support being innovative and agile. Um, we work with a lot of people um, who are, we can see a few names there, like BBC, UNICEF, big NGOs, trade unions, um, uh, big bodies like that, and also very small organizations as well, so local uh, social enterprises, uh, initiatives, uh, positive startups, and individuals just who want to do a project to, um, you know, uh, positively change the world. So um, a few other people I can see are coming in, joining in the waiting room. So don't worry, we've just got, if you have just joined us, we're just getting started now. Um, okay, some of the projects that we've worked on, uh, we do a lot of like data-driven projects. So we do things on the right there, you can see it's a data dashboard for a UK-wide uh, ticketing sales um, project called uh, Audience Finder. And that takes gigabytes and gigabytes worth of data on ticket sales and it allows arts institutions to go in and query it and, and see how their, what their performance is and benchmark their own activity against other um, theatres and uh, galleries and, and so on. And we work with Greenpeace um, and doing lots of campaigns, again, driven by data. And we also did a big, very big campaign for the National Education Union called School Cuts, which um, apparently changed 700,000 votes in the last election um, by exposing the amount of funding cuts at, at schools at a very, very granular uh, local level. So um, we also do a lot of design sprints, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, if we were not in sort of lockdown -y, pandemic -y sort of scenario, we'd be doing a lot of them in, in, in the flesh, face to face, and they would look a lot like this. Now we have actually transitioned to doing them online, which is uh, really interesting and comes with its own challenges, but also works really, really nicely. Um, and so here you can see some screenshot, there's some um, photos from a, a session that we did uh, about two years ago with a sustainability organization. So you can see we're like working on ideas, we're doing some user testing and uh, it's hugely productive. It produces a lot of post-it notes, uh, a huge amount of post-it notes and um, Fortunately, post-it notes can be recycled, which is something that we found out when we started doing them. And typical outputs from our design sprints, uh, or for anyone's design sprints actually, not just ours, uh, is um, prototypes, which I'll talk a little bit about more in the future, uh, in a minute, sorry. Um, so we do prototypes of um, apps, we do sort of service flows, we do websites, but also a design sprint doesn't have to be used for a technical thing. It can be also about um, working out a, uh, uh, a system or it could be for, for producing a manual or anything that you want to create and get into the hands of people um, is, is a perfect thing to, to do with a design sprint. Generally, just before I crack on to what goes into a design sprint, I just wanna say that we do have a design sprints a few different kind of iterations. So we started with a five-day um, Google design sprint. So Google um, has this a five-day um, uh, structure, which I'll explain in a second, but we also run uh, shorter ones as well. So we do three days and one days as well. And one day design sprints are great for getting your like stakeholders to buy in and to trust your team to keep moving forward. And um, if you've been on one of these um, sessions, we'd be very happy to offer you a 30% discount uh, for a design sprint. So just like, reach out to us and, and uh, let us know. But today, what are we going to do? Well, um, we're going to be looking at design sprints and what they're made of and what we go into them. We also want to spend some time talking about um, how to adapt them, especially for social impact organizations. And also one of the things I, I really think is quite valuable is talking about the blockers and getting people in your organization to actually attend or be a part of or trust a design sprint. And then we, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you plan uh, a new project after a sprint. So that's something that we, we do quite a lot of as well. And uh, questions as well. Um, so that's what we're planning to do. 
Uh, and if there are any questions uh, right now, like about what we're going to cover, or anything that you'd like us to um, um, uh, address as, as we go, you please feel free to just drop them into the chat and um, Maddie or myself will be, uh, be looking out for them as we go. Okay. Uh, so I hope we've all got a cup of tea or coffee ready and we'll crack on. <coughs> so design sprints, why do we do design sprints? Well, um, I think in the way of answering this, the, uh, we have to sort of think about um, the value of a design sprint comes down to some various sort of principles that we should hold on to. And this for me is one of the core ones. This idea that um, with a small amount of effort, you can deliver on a huge amount of value. So you've probably heard about this 80-20 rule. Um, so with 20% of effort, you can deliver 80% of the results. Now, when you're making a thing, and I use the term thing to mean a technical project, uh, a poster, um, a, uh, a system, or whatever it may be, um, I'm just going to use I'm just going to use the term a, a thing or a product interchangeably. So don't necessarily think I mean a technical product. But when you're making a thing or a product, um, you can deliver a huge amount of value to the people you're trying to serve um, with a, with a small amount of effort. And then gradually, if you want to make deliver 100% of value and deliver the last amounts of effort, then it's going to last, last amounts of value. Sorry, the last remaining 20%. It's going to take a lot of effort, a huge, huge amount of work. Things get more complex over time, there's more sort of constraints, um, but you can start delivering value quickly. The other important principle as well is this concept of minimum viable products. Have, um, has anyone heard of minimum viable products? Yeah, so Richard's heard of some, okay. If you have, a, Richard, would you like, do you think you might be able to give us a, do you want to attempt a on the spot definition of a minimum viable product? Um, it's trying to find like the smallest thing that could possibly work, I think is one definition of um, minimum viable product. Um, it's about trying to not over engineer things and trying to get something that gives enough that you can start to get some useful feedback um, on whether your idea is going to work or not. That's fantastic, yeah. Thank you. So um, it's the smallest possible thing that you can release that really achieves the, the aim that you're trying to do with, with the people you're trying to serve. Um, so exactly as Richard said. So um, this image I think is a really great one. It's quite a famous one, you may have seen it. So um, the traditional way of making a product or, or launching a project is um, let's say that we have an ambition of getting people from A to B. That's what we want to do. We're serving people getting from um, home to their parents' house, for instance. Now, um, we could scope out a car and, and spend a long time defining exactly what needs to go into it and then building it bit by bit by bit by bit. Um, a better way of doing it would be to actually um, launch something quicker and sooner. So we have a smallest possible version of, um, uh, would be say releasing a first release would be like a skateboard you see down here. It still serves as a function of getting people from A to B. It maybe doesn't deliver the right amount of satisfaction that um, uh, people want. Excuse me a second, sorry, I'm being bothered by a munchkin. Sorry, hold on a second. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. So, um, and then gradually we will release successive versions of it. So we go from a skateboard to a scooter, to a bike, to a motorbike, and then gradually we have a, a car. And all around all that time, we've been delivering value to the people that you're trying to serve. But the other important thing to realize is that doing these successive iterations along the way, um, you actually end up with an end product, which is better than the, you know, we've got an actual convertible now, right? and it's a much more positive, enjoyable experience. But, so why do we do a, a minimum viable product? Um, does anyone have any ideas? I've kind of mentioned a couple of things and Richard's mentioned some. Is there anything, what are the gains from taking that minimum viable product approach? You start your learning early, you know, with something real rather than, you know, uh, than, you know, I mean, traditionally, 
detailed specifications and I'm sufficiently old to remember the days of functional specifications and things and um, it's very difficult for people to evaluate them whereas if you've got something real that you can give to users and get you know real feedback on then your learning is is much greater so that's exactly right so um as Richard said, so learning is the key output of a design sprint, also a minimum viable product, and also for a design sprint as well. Um, even if things don't work, you know, the fact that you're getting a huge amount of learning and a huge amount of feedback is, is key and really, really key. And the other kind of things that um, come out, obviously, are you reducing risk. So if you're like defining that huge functional spec and um, spending months working out and talking to those consultants, um, is a lot of effort, a lot of um, cost in that and a lot of risk that you're defining the wrong thing and people actually don't want that. Uh, and also uh, it's going to shorten the development cycles and get things out there quicker. And also it's really important to realize that even no matter how close you are to the people that you're trying to serve, you have a lot of assumptions. You've made a lot of assumptions about what they need and who they are and the context that they're in. And certainly an agency that you work with will also have a lot of assumptions that they bring to that. But releasing early um, allows you to test those assumptions. Another principle I think is very, very important, and I'm just gonna move to the last ones a couple of quickly, is this idea that a problem properly represented is largely solved. So in going through a design sprint, um, you're going to, oh, I should say, I'm gonna send the slides around. So don't, don't worry if, um, uh, if you feel the pressure to take notes. I should have said that at the beginning, sorry. Um, a problem properly represented is largely solved, which basically means that um, if you start putting all the component parts of a challenge up and you start moving them around and finding the connections, ideas and possible solutions seem to present themselves. And last thing design thinking comes from this uh, process. This is from a great organization called Interaction Design uh, Foundation. And these outline the key steps where you're building empathy with the people that you're trying to serve, the users. Uh, defining the problem, coming up with uh, concepts or solutions in an ideation phase, which is, sounds like a buzzword, but it's actually um, very, very useful to have this definition of what it is. And then building a prototype, which I'll look at in a second, and then testing them, getting them into the hands of real people and uh, seeing how it performs, which is terrifying. I, I'll have to, no matter how many times you've done it, when you do user testing, it's, it's really, really terrifying process. Uh, and last of all, they come from Google. So Google Ventures started the des uh, design sprints. Um, they work with lots of uh, organizations and then they created this book. I really can't recommend this book enough. Have a get it, you can read it in a weekend. It's very, very simple. It's, a, it's got a little bit of um, San francisco -y sort of Tech Valley speak in it, but it's very, very readable. And if you want to run design sprints yourselves, you can read this book and then just do it. It literally says, um, if on Tuesday, you will need these kind of pens and this stack of post-it notes, and this is how long you should spend on this, this, this. So um, you can get it, and then it's just diving in and giving it a go. And broadly, their structure of a design sprint looks a little bit like this. So a Google sprint, not, not one, I think, which is great for social impact organizations, but a Google one. So the first day is essentially defining what you're going to be working on. So looking at the concept, thinking at, uh, so looking at the challenge, looking at um, the um, how uh, the user, uh, the people that you're trying to serve, or the various actors who connect with your your um, the thing that you want to make, how they move through it in a very top line way, and then picking out the main area to work on for the rest of the week. And then day two, researching how other organisations have already solved this problem and coming up with your own concepts and responses. And then uh, day three, uh, storyboarding a more detailed user journey through this um, through your concept. And day four, making it, making it in a day, which is um, using whatever tools you have to hand, uh, whatever you can build a smoke and mirrors prototype on. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. And then day five, testing it, seeing how it goes and learning as much as you can. Uh, I'm gonna show you a quick example of a um, design sprint uh, prototype. So this is one that we made for a organization called Moodle. They, um, they, uh, how to say, they wanted to build a, um, a way of people to collect. Uh, Moodle is a big sort of global sort of educational platform, it allows um, teachers and learners to sort of um, come together and build a, sort of, it's a learning management system really, I suppose. And um, they wanted a way for people to be able to grab assets from the internet and for teachers especially to curate them into packages. So we did a design sprint with them and um, we produced this prototype in a day. We had a couple of designers working on it and then we tested it on day five. Uh, and I'm just going to show you, um, 
I'm going to show you a little video to show you what it looks like and what I mean by smoke and mirrors prototype. Hopefully this is going to work. So with a bit of luck, you're seeing YouTube. Right, so you should hopefully be seeing a um, screen capture of someone walking through a, um, uh, an app where we've designed just the front end, how it looks. So you've got um, a community uh, of people who've gathered content. You can see they've got members. Um, you can scroll down it, you can scroll up it, you can click the buttons and uh, it feels like a real product. So now they've clicked the join the community page and they can see there's some discussions here. They can see users, um, there's comments, they can go all the way down. And I think that they're probably gonna click on some other things in a second. Oh, they go. opening a menu, click on the icing and profile page. This feels like a real thing, but it's not a real thing. It's um, literally just all smoke and mirrors. It's just a collection of uh, design screens that we've used off the shelf software to stitch together and make into a um, prototype that you can take to people, you can take to stakeholders, you can give them a link, you show it on their phone and you can get them to play with it and see how it feels. And once you do that, then you really learn a huge amount. Okay, I'm going to pop back to uh, the presentation. And then we're gonna start looking a little bit more in detail what the uh, actual days look like. So, um, where are we? Before we before we start, does anyone have any questions at all? Uh, Maddie, I don't have my chat open. Has anyone? Uh... No, it's no one. Everyone's listening in. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Uh, if you do have anything, feel free to, to whack it into the chat. Um, so day one, like setting a goal. What does that actually uh, look like? Uh, it looks a little bit something like this. So here, um, one of the key activities that you do is that you take, uh, you identify who are all the, the actors, who are all the people who are going to interact with the thing that you're trying to make or build or do. So it could be users or customers. Um, it could also be your internal teams. It could be your funders. And uh, uh, it could be anyone who has some sort of relationship or some sort of contact with, your, with the, the concept or the, the thing that you want to do. What I'm showing you here is an example of um, this organization that was working on a sustainability project. They wanted people to go out into their local communities, capture evidences that businesses were doing things in a sustainable and ethical way, and if not, try to encourage them to shift, say, their, their coffee supplier to one that's more ethical and sustainable. Um, on the left here, we've identified a number of different um, uh, uh, actors. So we had local community activists. Uh, we also had business owners and, and, and kite mark organizations and certifying bodies. <coughs> and then we, we have about five or six steps that we just go through where um, we imagine what are the, the things, the main top line, very, very top line things that people do moving through um, a solution to this challenge. We're not defining what it is, um, what we're building, but we are thinking that, okay, um, local community activists they're contacted um, maybe by their organization, a, a, um, a charity maybe contacts them and have a call to action. They go out into the streets, they organize or tie into local events and then they, then they go out and they recruit more members and, and so on and so forth. And, and then they go into the streets and capture evidence. So there's so some main steps here. Uh, here's another view of that same screen. So we've got, um, where this actually has a bit more detail. So the, the third or fourth um, actor down there is uh, the charities. So they will be doing um, uh, promoting act campaigns to their supporters and getting them out to, to capture data and then they would reward their supporters at the end. So essentially we, we did this for all the actors, defining what are the main steps that they go through in a, a solution. And then you work out where is the hardest part of this process. So one of the ways that you can do this is you can take your initial kind of top line journey and you pitch it to some external people this is kind of a, an ask the expert session, which is a, a nice way of saying it. You invite external people in for half an hour, one-to-one. -one, you just walk them very, very quickly through the, um, the concept of the challenge and steps that people will go through. And then you listen and um, they will tell you, you basically tease out of them, what is the hardest part in this problem? What's the toughest nut to crack? And you can see here that um, uh, we have, uh, I've circled some of these, um, these points in orange. And 
those came from, we spoke to about three or four um, experts and they consistently said, oh, getting supporters out onto the street is gonna be the hardest thing. A charity mobilizing supporters to do stuff is really, really difficult. So that's one of the big nuts that we have to crack. And then we think, okay, great. We, we, have, to, um, we have to spend a lot of time this in the design sprint solving that problem, thinking about how we can make that most effective. Um, well, the other thing that you do is this fantastic exercise called How Might Wheeze? Um, and um, you essentially, whilst you're listening, you uh, capture all the problems and difficulties and pain points that you hear. Uh, and so here we can see, I've, I've put them on, this is from another session from my interact online session that we ran. We capture them one problem per post-it note, and then you spend some time grouping them into common themes. So there's something, all the, the issues around like uh, privacy, for instance, or um, mobilizing supporters or whatever it may be. And then you take all the problems and you turn it around and you write a how might we statement. And here you can see there's a couple of um, examples. So um, how might we encourage smaller ways of getting involved without someone thinking that they're an expert? So um, we've taken the existing problem and we just rewritten it in a, in a way which gives uh, a stimulus or a prompt. It's a trick. You just start it with a how might we dot, 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 and, do, and then turn it into a question. But as soon as you've written it down, you start to get a little inkling of a possible solution. So um, how might we encourage smaller ways of getting involved without people thinking they're an expert? Maybe there's some kind of ranked system, or maybe we have some sort of mentoring uh, approach, or maybe we have um, like small actions, or we'd, we'd say, this is an action you can take in two minutes or five minutes or one day, um, or the level of skill required to complete an action. And you start to have lots of little ideas. You don't act on them now, but you kind of you just gather the stimuli. So those, yep, yeah, lots of how might we statements, a huge number of them, and we keep those up on a big, big board somewhere. Now, the second day is all about researching because the chances are the thing that you're building has already been not, not built by somebody else, but the problem that you have already identified as, as the key part from uh, this screen, the thing that we've circled in orange here, the big challenge is the hard nuts. Other people have probably uh, found ways to address these and, and um, design solution for these already. So you go out and you find them. Here is an example. So we, we were thinking, how do we mobilize supporters for this um, sustainability organization? We went away, uh, overnight you do a bit of research, you come back and uh, somebody brought back this from the National Rifle Association in the US. So they, um, the NRA, which is not an organization we would ever you know, think to look at, they released a, um, an app and in that app, its uh, supporters and its members get notified every time that there's a new uh, bill being proposed, which might um, uh, change gun freedoms. And um, they get notified of that, they open the app, and then they can see the bill flying across the screen. And there's a little silly little game where they can shoot it down and, and then they get some points. And then um, I think they get discounts if they shoot it down from NRA uh, sort of products. And um, you, uh, and then they get an action to go and mail their representative. So um, very, very fun, a bit of gamification. And uh, we thought, oh God, that's, that's quite interesting. What can, we, what can we borrow from that in our solution? And the other, then after you've looked at everyone's solutions, everyone's um, research, and you've uh, captured all of those things, and I should say you, you make sure that you um, gather that research and you throw it up in the wall and keep it visible so everyone can see it all the time. You always have that visual stimuli. But after that, you go into some um, uh, creative activity. So this is the first point when you um, get creative. This is an example of an activity called Crazy Eights, which you might have seen. It's very easy to run. You get everyone to take a piece of paper and you fold it up into eight squares. And then essentially you get them, people to look at all of the research that we've got to date, all of the how might we's and all of the, um, the, uh, um, the stimuli that we've gathered so far. And then you ask, you give them one minute on the clock and you say, okay, draw a, a quick idea in the first square, um, which occurs to you as something that we might want to do. And people individually sketch out some quite crude drawings of, um, of their ideas. And it's really just about emptying the brain, emptying the mind and um, getting your sort of initial kind of ideas out there. You, one minute goes and you move on to the next square, and then the next square, and then the next square. And it's a, it's a way of really like sort of brain dumping and freeing up the brain and visualizing uh, problems, uh, visualizing initial ideas. 
and it doesn't matter about the quality. A lot of people are quite scared about drawing, but you can see this is actually quite a good one. I, this isn't one of ours. This is one I just borrowed because it was a nice photo from the internet. Um, but even so, you can still see that they're quite crude um, and they're a lot of stick men and that's fine, absolutely fine. Um, Richard, there's a question for you um, mm. from Malik. Can you read that? Sorry, because I think it's reg regarding the old slide, the previous one. Ah, okay. Ah, so um, good. So um, uh, Malik, sorry, thank you for that. Um, just to just to go back to that. So deciding where the challenge is, that really comes from um, uh, you. You know that you're going to design a solution, but in asking the experts, um, the external people, you pitch the idea to them, and they will repeatedly tell you that one aspect is very very difficult, and so that is where you decide um, where to focus your effort within the sprint. So I would, I would probably phrase it that way. You probably come into the sprint knowing that there's a big challenge that you want to solve for people. So maybe if you're a, an organization which works with uh, older adults, for instance, you know, maybe they're feeling quite isolated and undervalued and you want to design a thing which and, and do a thing which um, solves and relieves that, that feeling and, and makes them feel valued. It makes them, you know, increases their sense of involvement in the community. And you have this initial kind of like product uh, walk uh, concepts, top line concept walkthrough. And then you, when you tell it to other people, you invite the experts in and they will consistently tell you that some aspects are harder to solve than others. And that's where you have to design your solution. So I hope, I hope that helps. Uh, okay, so um, after doing crazy eights, where do you go from there? Well, by now you've got so lots of people in the room. You've got about seven or eight people in your team in this design sprint. Uh, I'll talk about the who to bring along later. Um, and everyone's done one of these crazy eights and they've all struggled, they've all embarrassed. And there's probably one or two little interesting bits in each one's thing. And it's quite intense, um, but that's fine. Um, where do you go from there? Well, the next point is you take one of these ideas and you spend a, a bigger chunk of time, about an hour, um, sketching out um, a better solution. So here you might draw out three or four key steps in the solution that you think of, uh, taking one of your crazy eight ideas perhaps, or taking something different and drawing out maybe a, a more detailed journey. Or maybe you're uh, actually sketching out screens, which is what I recommend if you're making a digital product or a um, printed product, whatever it may be. What does the person see? So here we have four screens from that sustainability project. Two of the, the top two are from a charity mobilizing its supporters around recycling and sustainable fishing. And then they can choose whether this, they're te communicating with their supporters via uh, email or Twitter. And the idea is this is like a charity dashboard. And then at the bottom two screens, um, a supporter is now looking at Twitter and they are using a little plugin which sits on top of their um, browser and um, allows them to just tag if a business is posting on Twitter about say their more uh, equal hiring practices or there's sorry the recycling initiatives or, or using the difference of fish stock um, yes and if you work with a designer um, this is what you get you get loads of stuff and they just go crazy um, and they produce lots of screens so here you can see that someone has just spent an hour creating about uh, 12 or more screens of what someone sees and that's essentially what you spend uh, most of the day doing on day two um, Richard, mm -hmm. Sylvia wants to know if the crazy eight is that totally blank as you start, so no, nothing presets. Is that uh, well? Um, yes, no. So it's a blank piece of paper, uh, and but you you have already done these uh, stimuli activities. So the how might we use the research? And what what I think is a good idea is before you do the crazy crazy eight just direct everyone back to the boards and say, okay, everyone spend five minutes in silence, just looking over all the stimuli that we've got, all those how might we's. And as they look over, ask, invite them to write down a few little notes about anything that they think of or anything that catches their eye, such as I want to, I want, you know, I want to solve this privacy issue or I want to make sure that um, charities get feedback on what their supporters are doing. And then and you have, end up with a list then you go into the crazy eights and you say, pick an idea, pick a pick something that stood out to you and, and sketch it. What does that look like? And put one minute on the clock. And then you, people might go, oh gosh, what's the charity's getting feedback. Well, I, I, that's one of the things I thought maybe the charities have a little dashboard. I'm just gonna sketch out a little dashboard. It's a screen with some numbers on it and that's it. 
that's fine. Uh, so just to confirm, you're still working on multiple problems at this point in time. Is that? Uh, it's it's a sort of narrow, you know, it's sort of it's where you do the narrowing down, I suppose. That it's, it's the same similar question to Malik, really. Yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great um that's a great question. Well, I suppose you have come into the design sprint with a, a you've recognised a need, so you you know that um there's a pain point out there a challenge or a problem that you want to design a solution for and you probably already got an initial idea of kind of something that you want to do you know whether it's going to be an online thing or it's a, a service or something like that um when you're still doing the when you're at the crazy h you're still doing more and more ideas you're doing a lot of like idea development concept development and all the possibilities are broadening out and you're focusing on different aspects i think of the problem so um you know, the experts have already said that these, this is a challenge point over here, such as um, mobilizing supporters to go out and do stuff. That's a challenge point. We've also captured a few other things related to that about, um, uh, say, privacy or uh, feedback or um, I don't know, a few other things. And so you'd be sketching around this kind of ballpark. I'd expect people to be like, how do you mobilize people? There might be some lots of crazy eight sketches on that and also some other some other drawings around um, uh, so some of the other issues. What I think happens, what, the, the point of getting the experts to focus on this challenge though, is um, you're setting a kind of um, uh, a flag to say, this is gonna be a really complicated thing. So we should probably spend more effort on this particular aspect of the, of the, of the, this, the solution that we develop has to really solve this issue, okay? So as if you're facilitating a design sprint, I would always remind people that we have this big challenge about mobilizing supporters. And so, if you're doing that, so, okay. yeah. so on your, if you go back to your previous slide, it looked like, uh, no, the one with the good finder at the top. Uh, oh, sorry, yep. Uh, where was it? Uh, is this one? Yeah, that one, that looked like two different ideas or two or three different ideas still in terms of different, you know, targeting different aspects of the same overall problem, but you're, I mean, one is looking at it from an organizational perspective and, and the, the bottom one is looking at what um, a, you know, a supporter might do. Have I got that right? Um, you have essentially, um, I, you know, I can speak to, the, I actually drew this one. So um, the challenge, the challenge point was how do you sort of mobilize supporters to get something to do something because we knew like talking to people talking to the experts they consistently said it's hard to reach them and it's really hard to get people to go out onto the street and walk up and down the high street and go into shops it's a very big barrier to to do that's a huge amount of effort for them it's very intimidating and so when i when i was sketching this idea out i thought okay how can we make this the simplest way of doing it what can they do without leaving their homes and so i just thought well if they could just log onto twitter and then actually just tag the conversations that they see flying around the internet um, uh, as evidence that a business is being sustainable or ethical that achieves the the, the goal that we're aiming for which is uh, we'd identified a goal about um, you know raising um, businesses uh, to be more ethical and sustainable um, so that i think that was where i started on this sort of view but then i realized that the we'd, off, we'd also need a way of the organization to actually um, tell people to do this so it's, it's for this this example here is like two sides of the same uh, okay. solution. So I hope, I hope that makes sense. Sorry, that wasn't clear. Um, oh, there's one more one more point I should say actually. You probably noticed the little red dots. So what happens is after everyone's done their sketching, um, you essentially do a little gallery. You show the ideas to people. Uh, you do actually do this on day three, I think, in the morning. Um, you show the ideas to people and um, you get them to do some voting on what they think is the most valuable uh, solutions. So it might be the big concept, say the whole, like this, these four screens as a whole thing, this whole idea, you know, that's really, really valuable, really, you know, we should hang on to this and take it forward somehow. Or it might be components within it, such as um, this little dashboard, uh, you can see, you know, there's a, a user that the charity user is able to just select which kind of campaign says people like that and you do a little we do dot voting so everyone has a, like, a whole bunch of dots and they can just dot the things that they think are an interesting and valuable solution but, but well there's, there's value in that solution i should say and we should take it forward 
So, um, and then at, towards the end of this, you kind of get a, um, uh, a feel. If you've got five or six or seven people in the room doing this, you see some clumps. There are a lot of like solutions. There might be a standout solution, which I think is rare, um, where we think this is the idea that we want to like take into actually like designing properly within the design sprint. Or there might be, you know, bits of this and bits of this and bits of this. Uh, you know, this one has really handled the idea of like charities getting mobilizing the supporters, but this one is really good at um, the things that the supporter does and how they feed back on their actions. So maybe some way we can sort of merge the two into a final concept. And that's what you you um, you need to kind of like get consensus that um, uh, not consensus get consent that you could take these kind of two concepts and, and work them into one final thing in a design sprint. And that's what you spend day three doing. You essentially start to storyboard. Um, it's a bit like a storyboard for a film. You, uh, you look at um, the very first moment that uh, someone hears about the product that you're designing. So um, you don't start on the homepage if you're making a digital product. What does that look like? You don't think okay, a user comes to our homepage and then starts doing the thing. Um, you think, okay, what's that? how are people actually going to hear about this? Are they going to hear about it through word of mouth? Are they going to hear about it in a meeting? Is someone is you know, is someone going to say you should try out this service and they'll send it to their friends on WhatsApp, um, or is it uh, Google? Are they going to like be searching for it? So you think about the first point of contact um, with the with the idea, and then the route into it. So will people come into the homepage, uh, or will they land on a, um, a particular page in the website or, or some other sort of main access point? And then you plot out the storyboard of what it looks like to, to go through there. So these are really for our reference of what, um, what happens in each of these steps. And um, you, can, you don't really see it on this screen, but one of the things that you can actually do at this point is you can go back to your solution sketches and you can grab some of the sketches and put them into the storyboard frames. So you know, for instance, that you, we need a, a, at some point the, um, the user, the charity user is like, issuing um, uh, calls to action for their supporters. Hey, we've got a screen for that. Someone sketched it. It's not great and we need to change it a bit, but we're just going to take it and put it into the storyboard uh, just so we get a sense of, of what this might look like. And gradually you end up with a more sort of populated uh, storyboard. You can grab, if you're doing an online session, you can grab photos from the internet and just paste them in uh, and make a storyboard that way. Um, or you can like sketch some things out and then just take a photo and upload them. And we do a lot of that. And maybe if uh, I have a few minutes later, I'll, I'll grab a, um, an example of one that we've done online. So you storyboard it all out, people going through the more sort of detailed journey through the thing that you want to design. And then you go on and you build it, you make a prototype. And as mentioned, this needs to be um, smoke and mirrors. So it doesn't have to work, but it should feel like it's a real thing. You need to be able to give it to people in some form and they can uh, interact with it. So, um, there's a number of ways you can do this. There's a number of tools out there, such as um, Adobe XD, which is more of a high-end sort of tool. There's a tool called Pop and Marvel, which I'll show at the end, um, which is, allows you to take a photo of a sketch and then stitch it together in, with other photos to make a, an interactive. Uh, but you can also just use PowerPoint. So you can just design a thing in PowerPoint because you've got a number of screens. Uh, I think you can link them together in, in um, PowerPoint as well. And you can, even if you don't have PowerPoint, you can just sketch out all the screens, all the steps on paper. And when you come to user test, you can put the paper things in front of people, get people to pre press the button where they'd like to uh, press the button. And then you swap in the, the next screen or you move in the, the updated thing into, the, into what they're looking at. Um, I would let aim though um, to go for like that, something interactive that they can see on a real, if you're making a digital thing, a real device. And I'll just talk about the last day and then we'll take a break for some more questions and maybe take a couple of minutes break and then we can talk about how we can adapt. This is still like the Google Sprint, how you can adapt it for social impact talks. User testing, okay. User testing is great and it's uh, terrifying before you do it, but it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm gonna show you how we do user testing in Outlandish. Um, you don't have to do it this way, but essentially the principles uh, are really, really good. Um, how we do use testing, if we're making a digital thing, we would have, um, we'd invite five people in, one at a time, we spend about an hour with them, we sit them in a, uh, a room, 
and we have uh, a camera on their device, which you can see up here, we're watching a video feed of that camera. We have a camera on them, and um, so we can see how they're interacting with the device. They're flipping up and down, let's say it's on the phone, it's flipping up and down the screens. Uh, you can see what they're pressing on. We can also see their face. So you can see that they're frustrated or frowning or scratching their hair or taking a long time to think or, or whatever it may be. Um, and we feed all that into another location where all the team involved in the design sprint are actually, in, uh, are actually um, looking and quietly observing. There's a facilitator in there with a test subject helping them and uh, everyone else is just furiously scribbling notes in the other room and observations. And they end up with something that looks a bit like this. So there are five kind of, um, uh, actually sometimes there's another one, sometimes it's six, um, it's the main areas. So you capture all the questions from the user. What have they asked you whilst they've been interacting with this? What are the behaviors that they have shown? Have they shown like joy when they've reached to a certain screen or have they set, shown surprise uh, when they were able to do something and they didn't expect it? That's fantastic. Capture that stuff, it, you know, it's gold. Any ideas that they've thrown up and also elements that they've liked or disliked. I would also add to this one, it's not on this image, um, any errors or mistakes that they've made. And those could be things that they've, uh, uh, an, uh, an error could, uh, well, it's basically like a slip up. So if they pressed the wrong button, or for instance, they knew they wanted to press the other button, but they pressed the wrong one by mistake. Or is it some sort of misconception? They thought that pressing that button would do something different. And then they're actually, uh, they've made a, um, an actual mistake really in, in, in what they assumed. You capture all of this stuff and at the end of the user testing, you identify um, what you think are the most important priorities to solve. So um, again, you can see that we've got some dots. So everyone takes turns dotting all the things that they think are really important. And then you think, okay, we've designed our prototype. We've got it. We've learned a huge amount and we've really got to identify the next steps, the things that we need to solve. The dots have helped us to think, okay, we have to solve this content issue or we have to solve this like a, um, this issue that people had about the usability of the navigation, everyone was really, really confused. And so you have essentially a next steps, and then you can go to your stakeholders or you can go to your funders and you can say, this is the thing that we've made. This is how we want to improve it. And this is the evidence that we've got for it. Just to read, just to read. Oh, so the other thing that you can do is you can also set people challenges like little missions. And then um, you can ask them like to try to do this thing and you can uh, capture whether they've actually uh, managed to achieve it. That's also really, really useful as well. Um, so user testing, you only need five people. Uh, well, actually, I should clarify that. You only need five people from a, each user group. In a design sprint, you probably only got um, enough time to do five people. That will take you a whole day. Um, and I say five people from each group, because let's say that you're designing a resource for um, visually impaired people to, to find restaurants that they can go to. Um, you might want to test with a, a group of five visually impaired people, but you might also want to test the same resource that you make with um, their, their non-visually impaired family members as well, because they will also probably be using this as well. So you have like five family members. One-on-one, -on -one, give them submissions. If a, if your role is a facilitator to keep them talking and do not steer them and give them the answers. Uh, it's quite hard to do and it's, it, it seems a bit mean to do that, but also um, it's just, you know, get them to verbalize as much as possible what they're doing, what they're thinking. Um, you know, I'm going to look down here to see whether I can save this thing to my bookmarks. Oh, yes, I can. OK, I found that. Um, and capture uh, these 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 core areas. Uh, um, right. sorry. Richard, sorry, you got two questions. OK, cool. Uh, from Alison and Sylvia. Do you want to have a look? Yeah. yeah, do you want to read them out? So, uh, so Alison wants to know, can you remind me about Pop Marvel for prototyping, I think? Uh, okay. Um, yep. Yeah. And what's the, the other question? And so Sylvia wants to know, um, how do you know how many testers are needed and how do you recruit them? Uh, okay. Very good question. Uh, Okay, I will skip forward then and show um, the pop marvel thing first. So let me, um, uh, don't look at the screens. Um, let's, okay, pop marvel. So um, let me, uh, let me see if I can um, zoom out to show pop marvel. Right, um, so it's a, uh, 
this is pop um essentially you can take a photo of uh, any sketch and you can save it on your device and then you use pop um or, or marvel uh, it's been bought out and i always get confused which it is it's called marvel actually um to you can use um the the app to connect the screens together so uh this is an example of one that i made in just a few minutes i am just going to share um share it. hopefully you'll be able to see this and hopefully it still works um okay can you see this okay so um I didn't, I just like sketched a few random screens. I didn't really think about what I was making. But um, here we have a, if I was looking at this on my phone, um, it would look the same way. But here I have a, a view of a sort of login screen. And I'm clicking, on, I'm clicking on the screen here and it's reminding me that I can press this button and it'll do something. I click the go button. And now I'm on this screen uh, and I can, um, what can I do here? Well, I can click the menu and I can open it and close it. And I can click on this bit I click there. Now I can see a profile screen, and I can go back uh, and go back there. So in a few minutes, I just created that with um, with uh, uh, Pop or Marvel, and uh, you can do that too. And it's free up to a certain number of screens, I think, and then it's a small amount, uh, a small charge to make more interactive things, um, uh, bigger things. And so you can take, um, you can sketch stuff and take photos, and then you can give the phone to one of your test subjects. Uh, and let them play with it. And it's really, really easy. And obviously you can sketch them as like as higher quality or low quality as um, you or your team can do. Uh, and as regards your other questions from Sylvia, wasn't it about a number of testers? Um, there's what well, the, the kind of like general rule of thumb is that you only need about five uh, people from each group to test with. And the reason why they say five um, is because very, very quickly you start to spot common themes uh, and common problems. So let's say that four of your five users can't even um, log in, or you know, three of the five users say that um, they're getting confused in the menu. Um, you know very, very quickly that that is probably gonna be affecting the majority of your users. And there's no point um, testing with 20 users because you're gonna get a diminishing return on all that hard work of arranging those tests and doing 20 hours worth of testing when you could just redesign those things and then run a, run a, run a whole new test all over again um, with a new sort of updated version of the thing that you're gonna make. Um, so yeah, so the, the rule of thumb is about five people from each group uh, and very quickly you'll st start to get some fantastic um, insights. We did a one recently with a, um, uh, an organization that is helping people to track their time in the TV and film industry. And, um, you know, there were, once we got it into the hands of, we, we built essentially a time tracking um, app for people to, at the end of every day, to log their time. As soon as we got it into the hands of people to, to test, we ran it testing and pretty much all of them said, um, uh, my contract isn't, you know, the contracts don't work this way. And, you know, or I have, I don't just have one break. I have lots of breaks throughout the day and the way that you've designed it, I can't do it. And I don't understand how I'm meant to separate my time worked out from my breaks. And that was a huge, huge insight. And there were loads of, and then there were lots of small insights that each of them had, but consistently that was a, a thing that people said. So we knew that we had to redesign. And so we went into another phase of work to redesign it to solve that problem. So the idea is just always to be moving forward and five give you five people in each kind of group give you enough to move forward. Um, does that, Sylvia, does that answer your question or do you? Uh, you're on mute, sorry. Sorry, not quite. I actually meant I, I've, I've reposted another one saying, I mean, it obviously presumably depends on what the thing is that you're designing, but um, I meant how many in total so what you, this is this is with your end user that you're doing the testing, uh, and it sounds like you've got several groups. To, to, for starters, if if you're only dealing with, you know, it, it, uh, an individual's problem who doesn't come with an organisation, or if the organisation is tiny, then the group that there may only be five people in total that you you test with, unless do you recruit them from outside or? Um, okay. Yes. Uh, so um, I would always recommend that these are five users from five of the end users. So if you are building a product for stroke survivors, for instance, um, then you and you're an organization that supports stroke survivors, 
then you would find five stroke survivors and then test your product within the design sprint with five stroke survivors. At the end of that design sprint, you would end of that testing, you would have a lot of insights and then you make a decision whether you're going to they rework what you've done and do another test with a different group of five people or, or, or whether you can whether you solve the problems and you can go into re launch it. Um, so recruiting it, yes, yeah, so within the design sprint, you, um, you need to sort of start to be thinking about who can we get to come in. Um, so end users, the people who will be using this product, you're actually going to um, uh, deliver um, and they should be cold to it. So they haven't really informed it much at the moment because you want that initial reaction when they come in. They don't, they know very little about what it is, but you explain, you know, just very, very light touch. We've built this thing that hope aims to help uh, stroke survivors. Um, actually, I would even say less than that. I would say, let's imagine that you did a Google search about support for stroke survivors and you saw this page and I would show them a mock-up of that. Uh, and then you saw, you know, um, this app was listed in the search results. And then I would say, what do you think, you know, what do you expect to happen when you click on that thing? And then they might tell you. And then they click on that thing. And then you say, okay, let's imagine you clicked on that thing. And then you show them the prototype that you've built. And say, okay, here we are. And then you would have, um, as a facilitator, you would have like a, a couple of questions about what are you thinking about when you see it? Um, what do you want to do? Uh, and then you would move on to, and a few other things like that. And then you'd move on to some challenges such as, okay, see if you can book a, uh, a consultation with one of our, uh, with see if you can book a consultation with a stroke survivor mentor or something like that and then th then you would you set this a challenge you wouldn't give specific direction about where to go to do it but then they would sort of try to find out how to, to move through and do it sure but i mean as in so for that example you'd have start you want you end your end game uh, partial end game is to end up with five specific users but you'd have started off with 25 55? Uh, no, no, five. Um, in total? Yes, okay. I think it's fine, to, it's fine to test. The thing that you design in the design sprint is fine. It, you should be aiming to test it with about five people. That will give you enough steps. I don't, you don't need a bigger group of people. To, we, we, it's not like a focus group. It's five people, one at a time. Um, does that answer your question? Does that help at all? I'll, I'll, I, I'll chat later. Yeah, okay. I don't want to, to hog. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. No, no, it's good. I, I'm sorry if I haven't if I haven't described it. Um, uh, but yes, we can come back to it. And, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, are there any other um, questions before we take a, a ten minute break? There are none in the chat. If anyone's wants to ask anything. Okay then. Should we? Oh, yeah. Richard, you're on, you, you've come off mute. Are you about to ask something? Okay, all good. Okay. Um, all right, then. Well, let's take a, a 10 minute break and get a cup of tea. And uh, I feel like I've been talking a lot. So sorry about that. Um, after the break, we'll go on and um, we'll look at how you can adapt this sprint process. So, some of the lessons that we've learned. So, if you're with a social change organization, you're delivering positive impact. Um, some of the things that we find very valuable when you're going through this process. And so, if we come back at um, uh, 22. Great. Thanks very much. I do. Yeah. Thanks.
Um, also, there's a question from Bjorn, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Bjorn, uh, sorry, um, from Denmark. Um, I, can you read that? It's got a good question. Yeah, redesigning current projects. Um, uh, yes, I think I think I can talk about that. Um, I'll we do talk about a little bit about existing projects and how to go through this process as well. Um, uh, but I might not be able to cover all of that, so maybe we can save the rest of it to the end, Bjorn, if that's okay. But I'll certainly try and, and touch upon it. Um, no, it's fine now. And Bjorn, are you, is that Bjorn who also came to yesterday? Uh, yeah, I was. Hey. Again. <laughs> Uh, I'm here. Hi again. Yeah, it's it's well, very exciting. Huh? Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, so it's more concrete today, like uh, prototyping. I, I like, I see. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I guess we should get going, shouldn't we? Um, uh, let's go back to my slides. No, not this one. Um, bear with me a second. Too many things open. Uh, right. I hope everyone got a cup of coffee or some tea. Um, I managed to bag a sugary jam donut with my cup of tea, which I'm very proud of. Nice. <laughs> I've probably got sugar all on my, on my face. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, Okay, um, can you see my slides at all? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, let's 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 crack on. So um, welcome back, uh, and thank you for staying with us. Uh, so how can we adapt our design sprints? And so particularly for social impact organisations, um, uh, there's a number of things that we've learned over the years of running design sprints, and um, one of the things that we think is really really important is using a theory of change when you start your design sprint. If you look at the Google Ventures book, the Google Design Sprint book, um, it's very, it's not very clear on how you set a goal for the work that you want to do. Um, and we have always found that a little bit um, uh, difficult. Now we use a theory of change uh, on all of our projects at Outlander. Should we use those on whenever we're working with a client to, um, to build something for them or you know, to change something for them? Uh, also on our internal projects. And it really can be applied to a design sprint process as well as a uh, alternative to just vaguely setting a goal for what you want to do. Um, a theory of change, it's, uh, it's a practice, if, you, if you're not aware of it, it come, it's a methodology, I suppose, um, that comes from uh, the non-profit sector, not-for-profit sector. Um, and it, it's, it has these three main parts of it. There's an idea of a final outcome at the top of the triangle, which is like the big end change that you want to deliver into the world, the big you know, impact, how you see things um, uh, changing. And it's got a very sort of aspirational. The next level down, you have outcomes. So these are all the, the things that need to change in order to deliver on the final goal. So these might be changes in people, they might be changes in behaviors, they might be changes in uh, external things. Um, and ideally, ideally, they should be measurable. And, and at the bottom, there's activities and tasks. So these the, are the things that you know, the, the project team have to do. We typically don't use the, the activities and tasks within a design sprint, but going looking at the final goal and the outcomes is really, really important. Uh, for example, we did a um, theory of change for a Greenpeace. We made a tool that allows people to, um, uh, to um, sort of, they had a campaign essentially that they wanted to target Oreo for their dirty use of palm oil. So we built a social media campaign for them. And we set a theory of change. Um, so the, the Greenpeace theory of change that we, we set for them looked a little bit like this. We had a final goal, uh, which, which read, we will launch a tool that mobilizes people to put pressure on Oreo over their role in destroying the rainforest. Um, and it makes them worry about their brand and how it's viewed and it, you know, results in them changing their behavior and switching uh, their palm oil uh, providers. Um, we collectively work on this and we all get to a point where we think this is a goal that we all uh, understand. It's also really, really important to do a do this sort of theory of change final goal because um, the uh, everyone who comes into a project, into a design sprint has a different idea of what it's meant to do. 
So going through a process collectively of, of all of us, like writing a final goal together and then rewriting it together. Um, so writing a final goal individually and then rewriting it together um, really helps us to get to a point where we can agree, this is what we want to do. This is the, th the big change we want to do as a result of the, the project. We also did, these are the outcomes um, which we had. So these are the tangible changes. So there would be a, a visual association with the branding. Um, supporters would use their own creativity. Supporters would be shocked by the messaging. And um, we'd also uh, get the uh, messaging into the same online spaces where Oreo um, uh, are very visible because they have a great um, social media following, very active. And we would essentially get right in there under people's noses. Um, so yeah, so working on doing a theory of change activity, it takes a, maybe a couple of hours. Um, it's really, really important. It really helps set your goal. Um, you can find out, you can just Google theory of change and you can find out how to run one uh, and do it, um, everyone individually and then bring their final goal. You know, they write their final goal. Uh, uh, they put them up on the wall and then collectively you start to write one which everyone can agree with is good enough. Uh, and that's, you know, gets everyone on the same page. It's also really important to do with your stakeholders on that first day because then they will actually, you know, believe that everyone understands what's gonna be tried to be achieved and uh, they can trust the project team to keep moving forward. I'm happy to talk about that, that a little bit more. There's a lot to unpack in theories of change, but they're really, really useful. But who should you bring to your design sprint? Um, that's a really good question, because, even though I just asked it myself. Um, who to bring? So essentially, um, you, you want to keep the team fairly small. I think probably you know, any more than eight people, including the facilitator, it starts to get a little bit unwieldy. Um, so you need a, a small, smaller team. But the most important thing is you really need people who can speak on behalf of uh, the people that you're trying to serve, your users. So um, I used to work with a, a big NGO and um, when we did projects, um, often we didn't bring in like the supporters, uh, you know, when we did projects that aimed at fundraising, for instance, improving the way that we do fundraising. Um, we often actually uh, weren't very good at bringing um, uh, our donors in. Um, but the people that we could have brought in, the people who are actually really good at understanding our donors were, were, the, um, were the people who are on the phones, the, the supporter care team, You're helping people with their direct debits, helping people to, to cancel their payments because they spoke to them every day and they knew their voices. They were really able to visualize them. They understood their wants and their needs. Uh, so bringing those kind of people into a design sprint is really, really important. And I think it's important to do that because as well, they're often not the ones included in developing new products. It often it happens like up here, that the senior people think about like what they need, to, what can be done. And they have maybe a bit of a vision, but the people on the front line are the ones who are actually speaking to the people that you know, you're trying to, to deliver change for. And they're getting them into the sprint is very, very important. Uh, secondly, I've, I've put here that um, if you're doing a design sprint, because you're only making smoke and mirrors, uh, a prototype, you don't need to worry about the technical um, uh, constraints or, or you don't have to think, well, we do we need a developer or a coder who's got these kind of skills to come in. It's too soon. It, that can all come later. Um, if you did even build anything in code now, when you move to a full product, you probably throw it away and start something with much more, which is much more scalable, not something that just can exist as a prototype. And it might be on, built on a completely different sort of infrastructure or, or, or stack. Um, however, someone who is technically minded, like a coder of any, of any discipline, probably knows a lot about like what can be done with tech. And so they're really good to have. So one of those, if you can, if you're making a tech project. Uh, and a designer, because they're just really used to this process. They're used to just producing their thoughts visually. And um, also, if you've got um, stakeholders or uh, directors or anything, they probably want to see something that looks good even after a design sprint. So just being able to show them all the material that a design has produced is very, very reassuring. Um, okay, uh, oh, anyone's got power. Yes, anyone who's got power, you, I think you should bring them into the design sprint and certainly at the beginning if they can't stay for the whole thing. Uh, so yes, yeah, so if they come into, the, I'll talk about that in a second, actually, but if they come in at the beginning, then it instills trust in the rest of the team that they're on the right page and they can deliver. Okay. Now, another thing with any organization, but especially I think with a social impact organization is 
um, being aware of power in the room. Uh, and the reason why I think social impact organizations should be aware of power is because, you know, hopefully social impact organizations are respecting people. And if you can't, as, a, as one of our colleagues said, like um, Bjarne, I don't know if you remember this from yesterday's call, um, if you don't respect people, you can't really innovate. And if you can't respect your colleagues and things, you can't really do innovation with them. So um, there is a lot of power and there's a lot of power in the room. And if you're facilitating a design sprint, be aware of that. We've worked where they, we've had ones where like interns have come to a design sprint of very, very junior people. And um, they don't feel that their voice can be heard or should be heard. Uh, and um, so they, so like your role is to help them or set up a way where they can contribute openly and, and without any, you know, maybe in, in a way which everyone has a turn to contribute if they want to. Um, also people who've initiated the design sprint probably have a very strong um, vision and maybe they're a bit more senior and they tend to do a lot of talking. So being aware of how you're going to deal with that. So we could have a little park board where you, where you just capture their ideas or their, their inputs, but you just make sure that you come back to them later, but you try and keep everyone else engaged and, and, um, and keep the, the activity flowing. One of the um, uh, things that the Google Ventures thing suggests is that people who've got power, so people who hold a budget or are more senior get more votes or they get bigger votes or something like that, or they get the final decision. Um, you can do that. Um, I don't necessarily think that's a great idea. Um, and I think if, uh, if you're a socially minded organization, you, do, you should work on something which is a bit more sociocratic. So at Outlandish, we do a lot of sociocratic decision-making and what that basically means is you do not like work to get consensus that everyone agrees that this is what we should do. Um, instead, what you're working for is you're aiming all the time for consent. So is what we're trying to do right now, this is what's being proposed, is it good enough for now and safe enough to try? So for instance, in you're creating your goal for the design sprint and the thing that you want to make, it doesn't have to be perfect. And everyone, nobody needs to agree it's perfect. Just everyone has to say, it's good enough. I can live with it. I don't have any huge concerns that will stop it moving forward. And this is fantastic for like a development project or an, an innovative, iterate, iterative project uh, and a design sprint because you can keep moving forward with, if, if everyone embraces this approach, let's just make it a little bit better. Let's just make it good enough and now safe enough to try. Um, then things will keep moving forward. I'm very happy to talk about this and answer questions as well. Could I jump in with a question, please? Yes, please. Um, hi, so Niangela from the Innovation Growth Lab at Nesta. Hey, um, so I just wanted to know if you've had any instances where, you know, during the design sprint, you've got those more powerful decision makers and they're like, okay, this is good enough. I'm happy to go forward. But then you get to the end where you basically have a plan of action to further develop. And then they come around and they're like, well, actually, I really wasn't happy with the idea in the first place because I've sort of seen that play out a little bit where we have brought in those high level decision makers at the start of a design sprint. And then, you know, we've worked really, really hard to get something that was, was good and people were happy with. And they've sort of like pulled out at the end, which obviously leaves everyone feeling quite demoralized. So I was just okay. wondering if you had sort of any insight on wanting things to move forward because you've only got like five days, three days, whatever it is. But then, um, you know, being conscious of the fact that these are the final decision makers at the end of the day. Um, I think, I think what I would say, what helps, um, we have had design sprints that haven't worked out as well as we thought uh, they would. Um, for instance, we've had a um, design sprints where the lead, the person who's brought it to us has got their vision, and no matter how hard we we try and sort of move things forward. They just they keep coming back to what they want to to um, to uh, to do. Like and it's very hard to sort of move them forward, uh, no matter what the rest of the team wants to take in a different direction. Um, so that has kind of happened to us. Um, but in terms of like what you can do to help avoid that, I think there's a number of things. One of them, I think, is just be really upfront at the beginning um, to say how do we want um to like, make decisions uh as a team so do we want for instance um we can all work collaboratively but ultimately um 
Jane, she's the like the person who's got the budget and she's the one who or who understands the users the most or or she's the one who's most senior, whatever it may be. Is she like the final decision maker at every step of the way? Do we want to run it like that? And is everyone okay with that? Um, or do we want um, to run something where we do sort of voting where everyone's got the same number of votes and it's very, very equal. And then it's much more like a sociocratic thing. Um, or also votes and um, maybe then Jane is the final decision maker if there's a tie. Or do we want to do something where we employ consent based decision making the sociocratic approach, which we always find it really, really works very, very well. And because it brings everyone up to the same level and um, it really helps people hear each other and what their concerns are. I can talk about the process of that, how it works or on the link or on our website, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about the sociocratic process and how to employ it. Um, but I think doing that on the, on the first day before you begin agreeing the process and how you're going to make decisions together can help. And um, that example that we did from Moodle. So the head of Moodle came over all the way from Australia to do the design sprint. And when we proposed that we were, we talked about how we're going to make decisions and we proposed um, the consent based decision making, he said yes. And because he'd said yes, and the team at the Oklahoma said yes, um, that was it. That was the decision. And then we were able to move forward. Uh, and um, from that point on, it was much more, more equal. We didn't get any sort of sticky moments. The other thing that I think is really, it can be done, I think, is, um, uh, is this idea that um, so if stakeholders don't have a lot of time, you front load their um, their involvement. So you in a design sprint, in a five day design sprint or even or a smaller sprint, um, you have a lot of activities that sort of open up all the possibilities and people are bringing new ideas in, contributing things, new ideas, new ideas, new ideas. And the range of things gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's a lot of excitement in the room. And then you get to the, like, the the, the apex, I think, of the diamond, and then you sort of come back down and you start to consolidate all the ideas and you have to make decisions. You know, this thing isn't over here, that's not quite right. Or we need to combine a few things over here. And gradually you reach the decision of like, this is the concept that we're gonna develop in the design sprint, this, this thing here. So if you can get your stakeholders in this process when you, all the ideas are developing and then get them past the apex, so that they've actually like see the direction that it's going in and they've agreed that we're not going to introduce any more ideas you know this is it and then we're going to actually just work on consolidating ideas i think the further along you can get them on this bit then the more likely that the outcome at the end will be um be one that the stakeholders agree with i think um yeah and obviously like power level stakeholders like it's pretty hard to get them to commit to five days so um, get them at the front as, many, as much time as you possibly can. And if they really can't come, just make sure that they are involved in the, um, the Ask the Expert session where you get them, you pitch the idea to them and they feel that they are able to raise the key concerns, raise the big challenges and give some direction to the team. Um, I hope that helps. Does that, does that help at all? Yeah, really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, uh, well, I think I've talked about this slide then, so I'll, I'll keep going. Um, if you're working on an existing product, so I think maybe this touches on Bjorn's question. Um, so let's say that you have a website or a tool or a dashboard or a pamphlet or whatever yeah, that you want to sort of rework. Um, I would adapt it like this. And so what we do um, is one of the things is rather than um, getting uh, external experts in, you can do that. But you are probably in a fantastic position um, to know all the issues. So we like to run a session where um, we call it the lie of the land or the state of affairs. And we individually take turns where we all describe what are the main issues that we're, we're working, what's not working for the people that we're trying to serve, you know, what's our product letting them down on. And everyone else is capturing and listening notes. And then we move into a how might we session where we group all the common things together. Um, in addition to that, um, chances are that if you've got an existing thing, a product, let's, let's say a website, um, you've probably got a lot of things like access to Google Analytics. You can take screenshots. You've probably done um, uh, some like just chatting with people. You've got anecdotes about how usable it is or isn't. And one of the things that you can do is just decorate the space with all of this input. Because people, you know, people know the product, but until they see a room covered with screenshots 
And then they, they say, oh, I remember that bit. Someone told me they just cannot use this bit of our product, our website. This is the hard bit. Or when you've got some like um, charts that show the number of users versus the number of people who unsubscribe or, or something like that or drop off. Um, decorate the room with it as much visual stimuli as possible is really, really useful. Um, so I think that is um, uh, a very good, uh, uh, a good way of like take, so starting to rework on an existing product. You probably well as well know that you want to, if you just want to improve it, you probably got a, um, a backlog of ideas that you want to improve on. And I can talk about the agile process and how, and, um, and uh, how you like manage a backlog as well at the end. Um, but those I find very, very helpful. Get everyone to speak about the problems that they know. Uh, and then decorate the space as much as possible with stimuli, show the product, you know, show screenshots, show feedback, quotes, everything around. You can also incorporate that into the how might we part. So if you've got loads of quotes, you know, capture those, put those into post-it notes, and then people again can use those when they're grouping things and finding common themes and then how, creating how might we questions. Um, next, I wanna just go on about blockers. Uh, people say they can't draw and people are terrified of drawing. I can't draw, I cannot draw, I can draw squares and that's about it. Anything else, I draw potato people and, and, and that's it. So if you are running a design sprint and you've got people in your room who just do not want to draw and are very scared of drawing, try to like sell it to them. So drawing, it frees up your mental brain. Uh, it allows you, it's like a sink. You, know, you have to empty the sink to fill it up with more ideas. You know, you let the water run out and then you can put more stuff in or refine existing ideas. Uh, and the other thing I think is really important is that a drawing is not complete. If you write down your idea, it feels complete. But if you sketch something, you know, it's incompleteness is its strength. Someone else could come to it and they can interpret it in a slightly different way and they might add something to it or you might add something to it when you revisit it. So they invite collaboration and they invite contribution. So always try to um, encourage people to sketch stuff rather than writing stuff certainly on the crazy eights as long as they know what it's it represents that's fine you know um the other, other big problem that we get is that people come to us wanting to do a design sprint and they want to work on um creating a huge thing which has to solve like five or six different uh user groups and everyone has to be on board for it to for it to be a win for it to work and that kind of product is not a product you're trying to, right from the word go, you're trying to make a huge like, network or ecosystem of things and relationships. And so if, I would really encourage people just to focus on one main user and get it working for them first. Uh, and so in the design sprint process, you have to essentially identify who's got the biggest need, who's got the biggest challenge, who's got the biggest problem. And um, then you choose those people, that user group as the one to design the very first version uh, of the product for deliver value for them first and then consider more users how can they be you know come into this space how can we start delivering value for them and build up that network and i have a slide about that later as well actually the other thing is like people like flashy sexy tech um and the trouble is a lot of like ideas that we hear or what's taken to design sprint they can be they can be the value a lot of the value can be delivered by using something off the shelf already. Um, and like blogs, for instance, and it, they're not sexy, they're very old, but let's say that you are designing a product which gives advice to people. You could build an amazing web app that has um, lots of uh, uh, ways for people to like input things or in a chatbot where they can drill down and stuff. But sometimes just a newsletter might be sufficient or a, um, a, a simple process for like reading a few blog pages and then arranging a chat, arranging a one-to-one you know, -one on the phone. That will deliver the huge amount of value. Uh, you know, it will solve the, your people's like, problem if they want advice on, let's say um, insurance, for instance, or they're, they're a freelancer and they desperately want insurance because they, they don't really understand how insurance can work for them. Um, something like that can actually, you know, deliver a lot of the value and then gradually you can improve it and improve it and improve it and add more features and functionality and deliver more things but deliver the core value first you can do it in a very simple way uh and another one i don't want to spend much time about this people just want to rush into build and that's incredibly risky okay there's always some time just to sketch something out and show it to somebody you know whether that's someone down the hall that's fine 
uh, I think one of the last things I want to talk about is um, the road mapping. So let's say that you've done a design sprint or you've got an idea for a, uh, something that you want to build. How can you like, plan to do this over time? And how can you roadmap it? Um, when we do a design sprint, roadmaps or, or we'll run a road mapping session, we end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So um, here we've got a simple graph with a chart, a timeline, I should say. Um, we've got uh, time along the bottom. And on the left, I've got two user groups here. Uh, and I've broken this down into um, four or five um, phases of work. It says sprint, but I suppose it's really phases of work. And each of these little squares represents a thing that we're going to build, like some functionality. And um, this is the kind of thing is very crudely done here, but this is the kind of thing that you should aim for in a roadmap. So in a roadmap, remove time from it, essentially divorce it from time, because um, a lot can change in six months, let alone five years. Uh, and so it, having it agnostic of time is, is really, really important, but just have it delayed, think the work to be done laid out in phases of work. Um, also, um, yeah, so if you're building something technical, things will change in a technical front. If you want it to connect to Facebook, well, Facebook may change the, its API, and now you can no longer do what you wanted to do in, in year two, for instance. So it's a very much a living document without time on it. And also, uh, it's done from the focus of the user. So it's done from the focus on the, on the people that you're trying to serve rather than from an organizational perspective. These aren't all the things that the organization wants to do over time. These are all the things that the user needs and we can deliver to them over time. Um, here's an example of, uh, of how something might look in one of our sessions. So um, here we've got a user group, we've got low income parents. We have identified the value that we want to deliver to them that uh, after using a new financial planning app, low income parents will feel more in control of and secure about their family finances. That was the, the, the vision that we, we set um, and the value that we knew we wanted to deliver. Um, and then we plotted out all our um, features of the thing that we wanted to make uh, in time. So delivering value first. Yes. So, OK, um, I'm going to go down to the end here. Right. So delivering like discounts and discount offers and things or uh, arranging to speak with a financial planner. That's fine, they deliver some value, but um, the things that deliver immediate value, most you know, critically are income, low income parents being able to see their bank balances and maybe um, forecasting their spend or like seeing something on a little dashboard or something or connecting their bank accounts. These kind of things deliver like the critical value. So having a roadmap that looks like this is what you should be aiming for. And how you get there is um, you focus on the user, you think about the value that they would have after using your product solution. So you have like your value proposition as I just showed you. So you know, feeling more in control of uh, your family finances. Then you think about all the, the features of the things that you want to build. So in, if you've done a design sprint, you probably come up with a sketch, uh, sorry, a storyboard and the end product and you've used testing. And you've got loads of different components in it still, the different things that you could do, but how do you know what, what to build first? Which aspects do you build of this first? So um, list all the different aspects, the capabilities of the system. Um, draw up a timeline and then you uh, essentially take each of these ideas on a post-it note and you work through them and say, can we still deliver um, speaking to a financial advisor? This this part of our idea. Can we still deliver the core value without it? And if the answer is yes, we can kind of still deliver the core value without it. You put it way away in terms of time. You, know, you move it way to the right. But if you say, can we still deliver core value without connecting your bank account? Um, then like, no, we can't deliver the core value there. We have to have, you know, people have to see their bank balance in this app. Then you put it right down at the start and you, you, start, to, you start to then organize things over the amount of value that gets delivered over time. And there's some few things that you can do is, um, like constraining it. If you're running, if you're doing this exercise with, your, with a team, constrain it because what I, what I find happens is everyone puts everything in the first column. Everyone wants to do everything now. But if you say to people, you can only put three in the first column, then gradually people start to make decisions about what should go where. And also you can give some steers like saying, if you think something is not gonna be of value to a lot of users, or if you think something's gonna be really complex for us to do on our budgets, then you know it should come later in the, in the timeline. And this is an example of what it looks like if we were doing it in the room. 
So here, yeah, same thing. We did this for a, a, journal, a news organization and um, they wanted to get their teams to really understand and feel confident about their mission. So this is, this is what we designed Spirit for. And the first thing that they decided, the most core value would just be have a content strategy because they did not have a content strategy. Um, and the rest of other stuff like um, uh, email reporting and being able to print reports up, you know, it doesn't give a huge amount of value to their team. Uh, oh, and sorry, and uh, we'll go to one more thing. I think it comes back to um, someone's point of view, uh, someone's question, maybe Bjorn's. Um, different user groups here. So you've got, we had like two different kinds of users. We focused on user group one first, and this is the value. We start delivering and launching and releasing value for them first, do that well, deliver more value, and then we introduce a second user group. And we start delivering things and maybe a third later on. So this, let's say that this is our financial planning app. Maybe this is, um, the users and low income parents, then maybe we've got like uh, their, their accountants or their net wider network or something like that. And that's it really. That is a, a very um, quick, also quite long introduction to design sprints. Um, I have a few resources just to show, uh, and then we can like talk some, do some questions. So um, I have, uh, well, I showed you Pop and Marvel first. So have a go with it. It's, you can play with the free one now, and it's really, really easy just to sketch stuff out and um, connect it. Uh, Miro, it's another tool that we use. So we use, um, we use this to do, uh, it's an interactive whiteboarding tool. Um, it has a free version, I think, uh, I can't remember what you get, and it also has a paid version. So this is what you're seeing here is an example of a, the top line user journey that we do on day one on Miro. So this was for the Stroke um, Association. And uh, we plotted out seven or eight key steps that stroke survivors would go through if they were, if they were running their own support group. And uh, you know, people are visiting this online hub where they can get um, support, uh, for inspiration from other clubs, other support groups, find some activities to run in their session. Then they like do the activity in their session. And then they come back and then they um, suggest their own activities and share them with other stroke survivor um, uh, groups. Um, yeah, we plotted out all these things in Miro and then we dotted the areas where we thought this is the hardest part to do. And we identified consistently over here that getting stroke survivors to create their own content is really, really difficult technically and, and from a usability point of view and from an accessibility point of view and how we do that. So then we put a lot of effort in our design on designing something which really supported people to go through a, the, the screens to create content if they were, if they had aphasia or language processing difficulties or um or they just weren't very like technically literate um uh, so mirror is fantastic actually i'm going to show you one more screen from mirror whilst i've got it um uh let's go back here um this is the storyboard that we did in mirror for um another organization which was a journalism product for getting a um getting local communities involved in the journalistic process so this is a storyboard that we did in Miro from a journalist's point of view. And um, so, uh, let me let's just see, hopefully, oops, hopefully you can see this. Uh, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Right. Um, so we had a storyboard right from the very top where um, uh, the journalism newsrooms are coming together you know, they're talking about um, uh, engaging their community in some reporting. And then we just started to sketch out the steps of like, kind of like screens that we did all through the steps of um, the journalists creating polls to engage their local community. Uh, and then choosing an audience that they could um, uh, reach out to. And uh, let's see, uh, sending this poll out to the audience via an email newsletter. Um, and you can see that we've grabbed some pictures from the internet, you know, to illustrate some of these steps. You know, the, the journalists are waiting here for responses to come back in. We sketched some things out as well because we had designers. We had two designers on the call, so it was, um, they were very good at sketching. Uh, and also, we've um, grabbed some existing, some of these these storyboard steps are actually copied over from the concepts that people created in our concept creation session. So they're all over here. Some of the the screens that we the, the team devised, they weren't perfect for the project, but they really illustrated what could be done in the storyboard. So we just quickly copy and paste them and, and throw them in. And uh, yeah, so that's um, one way that you're, that's one way that all the ideas get 
um, you know, they get put down and then they start to condense and come down into this sort of uh, final concept. Uh, and I think I've got one more thing to say and then I'll uh, hand over to questions. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to my slides. Well, I think it's my last slide. It's all the way down here, so many slides. Um, oh yes, just some, some resources um, which will be on the slides. So I've talked about um, the design sprint book. You can read it in the weekend. It, it's very, very useful. Uh, uh, Miro, um, this is a great book I love called Well Designed, How to Use Empathy to Create Products People Love. And it helps you think about road mapping and how to make decisions about what to do first. Uh, and then there is um, the Lean Startup, which is, everyone talks about Lean. It's, it's a nice introduction to the mindset of what Lean is, which is essentially um, defining value and then just reducing waste all the time, reducing waste, reducing documentation, and keep um, keep on developing. The things are never finished. You always improve it and improve it and improve it. Uh, and I can talk about the Agile process, but I think I should stop there to see if anyone has any questions. Uh, hi, Richard. Thank hi, you very hi. Much. My name is Julia and I'm a founder of a social network for university students called eye to eye um, We're going to rebuild it and we've just been through the whole process of we've got now a Marvel prototype of the new version of the app. Um, and I wondered, you do all this designing and prototyping, but are you linked to companies who can actually build the technology too? Um, uh, what happens after the sprint, after you come up with the design? How does that work? So how was it? Um, sorry, I have a four-year-old. She can have a snack, Mum. Hold on, sorry, I have a four-year-old. Hold on a second. Um, so uh, do we have connections with the companies that can make the tech? Um, so well, we are a tech agency ourselves, so we have developers and designers. And um, sometimes we will do a design sprint as part as the first part of a, a bigger project. Um, and we will you know, then go on to build the things. And so we will have our designers who are gonna work on it in the room and potentially the developer uh, as well. Um, uh, other, I think what the, the um, but if you weren't gonna use us, so we often like work with people who uh, just want to sort of consolidate their, well, explore their thinking and explore a concept and explore what they can do in terms of, by way of delivering a solution to a problem that they know about and problem that they see. Yeah. And the design sprint itself, like what gets produced, it's really like a, a very good illustration of the idea and how it can be solved. Um, I probably wouldn't expect it to be then taken and built straight away. I would imagine that that developers and designers would still, and we certainly would break it down further and, 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 and produce like the front, even if you make a front end in a design sprint, it's still gonna be quite um, uh, quickly done. And you probably want to sort of explore that and turn the front end into the exportable code, for instance. Um, yeah. But it's a really good way of illustrating how the product could work and what the core journeys are and how the solution can be solved. Yeah. And you can take it to a funder uh, and say, this is what we imagine it will look like. And this is the testing that we've done that can evidence where, you know, whether it works or if it doesn't work, how we should improve it. Um, I think it gives, if, if, I, was, if I was an agency and, um, if, and uh, somebody had a design sprint done externally uh, and, and came to us with it, um, I think a good agency would still want to explore it a lot more because they would still want to get up to speed and they still want to talk to you a lot about the idea and um, see if there are other ways that they can sort of improve upon it or help you refine it. Um, so if you are looking for an agency um, to build that thing, um, you should expect a good agency to still be very open to collaborating and talking. And I would encourage you to sort of take a sort of collaborative uh, approach with an agency as well. Um, I, you know, some agencies are fine with this, but outlandish we aren't. We, we, we don't want to be a supplier. Um, we would much rather be a collaborator because we also recognize that everyone's got different things to bring. We have a lot of like insights into the design and usability and uh, the technical build and how to sustain it. Whereas the, the people who come to us with the projects have a lot of insights and expertise about the issue and, and the people 
um, and um, and then the, the, the broader sort of context and, and landscape for for, for, develop, for delivering solutions to this. So we like to embrace a sort of collaborative approach as much as possible. Yeah. Does that, does that help at all? I don't know if I've answered your, your question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I didn't know you did, actually did the tech build too. So I thought it was just a design side. But yeah. Then- we we started we 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 start we've always been um uh very very tech uh and we have a sort of building tech products background but over the last like, four years or so we've done a lot more design sprints um and as i say it, doing a design sprint or well, it it costs money because it's people's time but in the long run you get so much further down the road than if you just went and built something uh, and you just ask a developer to build x um yeah you probably get a better product Thanks. Are there any more questions at all? Um, I've got a sort of observation, really, I suppose, and I'd like to interest to see what your reaction is. Um, I mean, really valuable, interesting presentation. So thank you, and a lot that I agree with. Um, the bit that I'm less certain about, or sort of wanted to share with you is I've got very interesting you know, I work in a similar field to yourselves and I've got very interested in com- in how you work with complex problems where um, complex is sort of defined as um, uh, messy entanglement or mm. interconnectivity and the the people who work in that field say you know that, that there is no one answer to a problem that um, you know, when you do something, you're changing the problem and you often get as a result um, unexpected side effects and so on. And um, I mean, um, for me, two fact, two things. One is that sometimes it's, there isn't just one idea and, I mean, and people who work in the complexity field say you need to be looking at what they call multiple safe to fail experiments, sort of doing multiple things at the same time. Now that has downsides in terms of it actually being you know, more costly in, time, in terms of time and effort, but it does mean you're not putting all your eggs in one basket um, and it allows you to explore different options at the same time. And the other aspect of it is really the time element in that often people's first reaction to something is not necessarily their reaction. You know, if, if, you, if you've come across the adoption curves and so on, people initially mm. will go, oh, this is really good. But when mm. they actually sit down and, and try and use it, um, you know, they find lots of issues and, yeah. and you, you're getting, and as I say, you're changing the system. And as a result, um, you discover things that you know, the, the system is now no longer the same as it was previously. Mm. Um, and for me, sometimes going more slowly with something and actually having done those, the sorts of work that you've described, but then taking a bit of time to sort of, you know, do a further trial or something where you're actually looking at how that works in practice, mm. sort of rather than in the lab. Um, so it's sort of random thoughts I'm throwing out here, but I just wondered what your thoughts were around those those sorts of things and what your experience had been. That's wow, well, that's that's great. Uh, that's a lot in there, and I and I do you know I feel like you've probably got some great insights on that actually. So it'd be really good to like to send some things around. Like if, if um, I would, my initial reactions. Um, uh, where to start? Uh, so you have those kind of like very wicked problems and very complex problems. Yeah, that's another term for complex yeah. com- problem. Yeah. Um, so on a very functional, like very practical level, whenever we make a product uh, at Outlandish, we always encourage um, uh, multiple sprints of work, phases of work, and a big period of bedding in between each release. So you, you do your first version of the product, you get it out into the hands of people, and um, and then um, it will change. So, so a lot of assumptions that you've had, you've got a lot of learnings as it beds in, and then you take that into your second. And then you realize that the problem wasn't quite what the problem you, you thought it was when you went in. Um, in terms of, uh, what was I gonna say at the other point? The, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't run an exercise like this, but I have heard of things like um, actor mapping where you you or like community based design where you look at um, how your product will the launch of it will change 
what impact on actors around um, around the community? You know, classic example is Airbnb. So, like, you you allow people to, to rent out their 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 accommodation, but also then it will have impact. They're not on on other people, like the neighbours and the um, town planners and all sorts of things like that, uh, but especially neighbours. Um, and um, so the exercises that you can do, as I say, I've never done them, but I've, I've read about them where you can sort of um, plot out um, the impact on other people and being aware of the impact on. Mm -hmm. So it's very critical. They're not users, but they are. They have some touch point with the system. Um, and there was a third aspect, of, which I was going to say, there was something else in, in, you mentioned, Richard, I've forgotten the third thing. What was Oh yeah. Well, the two things were sort of doing multiple things at the same time, and and allow. I mean, you've. I think what you said about actually allow. Yeah, trying to get something working in the real world, mm. and allowing some time for that to see what the outcome is, because again, often what you see initially changes mm. over time. Um, so I think yeah, I definitely endorse, and I, yeah, I've certainly done that. Endorse that as a, a technique, but. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think it, I don't think there are any easy answers to this. No. I think it to some extent, I mean, if anybody's interested, or if you're interested, I'm um, I'm actually looking at start seeing if I can get enough people to get a small sort of working with complexity in the oh. not for profit social change sector as a you know, discussion group together, because I think there's some interesting um, you know, it, it, I think complexity theory has some interesting stuff to say about, and it to some extent challenges the more linear theory of change. Um, you know, that we've got this, uh, you know, we've got this objective, we've got these outcomes, and then if we take these actions, we're going to deliver them. You know, the reality is that we know that often the problems that the, the sector is dealing with are, are very intractable, um, you know, and you've got these complex interconnections that means when you do something, all sorts of other things happen that you don't necessarily you you know that, that diff, essentially complex systems are unpredictable you can't necessarily predict that if we take this action it's going to get this outcome otherwise we would have solved youth unemployment youth yeah. crime yeah you know, all the issues that we've been trying to work with over the you know i've been around long enough to, to you know to have seen you know improvements have been made but um, it, you know, these are these are really difficult problems that we're working with. Well, I think the idea of a group sounds like fantastic. And so maybe what I can recommend is if everyone would anyone would like to be in part of that group, they just drop their email into the chat and to, to indicate that they're they're open for it. And then we can um, send an email to everyone just who is interested, just to say, you know, let's keep talking about this further. Thanks, Richard. Uh, are there any more questions at all? Hi, happy. So um, I think I'm going to follow up on the complexity, but the challenge for me about these design sprints is a little bit different, but I think there might be someone else perhaps that has a similar challenge. So I work with the donors. So the donors are trying to do something and they're doing it maybe at the government level okay. or the beneficiaries. So it's like they're not the direct recipients of the work, right? There's a, they're the middle layer, almost like working with the public sector. And the challenge I'm finding in trying to get them to do design sprints is they're so set already on what's going to be technology, it's going to be a platform. Mm -hmm. um, they do all the tools, right? There's, you know, that they're, but getting them to really do the sprint, they get stuck because they can't figure out who they're working for. So I'm curious, how do you get them? Like, are they working for the government official in the city office or are they working for the person on the ground Who's going to benefit from whatever the city office does? Like, how do we? How do you help shape those sprints? Um, I'd love any thoughts and advice. Uh, well, I think that's a uh, a question for everyone. Um, I oh, um, I would say, and I don't know if this is going to be any use to you. Um, I certainly think that when you're thinking who are the the actors or the users who, who come in in into contact with the thing that you're going to make or do it should include the the funding people the donor people you know because they are going to expect like reporting they want to see as a feedback or, or something or have evidence of impact for example 
And so that's a perfectly valid, you know, looking at your internal users of a thing is really, really important um, to consider them. And whether you make a choice, whether you're building the product for them in your first design sprint or not. So like, are you building out a way of like evidencing impact for them or are you building a way to um, help beneficiaries in lo like a local country context, for instance, if that is your primary user group and what do they need? So being very, very clear about that. Um, uh, I also, um, I, I think I'd probably go back to that comment. I, I, I don't have the, the ideal answer, but going back to the comment that um, getting like the end users, like the beneficiaries in the, in the process as much as possible uh, is hugely important. So that the idea of making things isn't, especially like an international development context, innovation and design sprints aren't something that are sprinkled on top down to the below and to and instigate change. And we have to build an app to, so women and girls can report, you know, sexual assault, that's not going to work, you know, and, and time and time again, those kind of approaches don't work, you know, in a local country context, but they still get surfaced again and again at sort of like a, big institutional level let's do that um so how you, do you move to actually include people uh, to to make sure it's focused on the beneficiaries um if i would just say try to include them in as much as the process or even get them to own the process as much as possible uh i do feel like i'm, I'm saying kind of like platitudes there and i don't know if this is um much use i think it's a much bigger conversation really of how how to manage that um, does anyone else have any um ideas richard um i mean just something else to throw into the pot is um there's a very interesting tool called sense maker i don't know if anybody's come across this which is about um it's about getting people to tell stories getting your um your stakeholders your wider community so tell me a story about being a um a stroke survivor tell me a story about being a, a low-income parent and then and you capture the story, but then you design a series of questions that then allow you to plot those stories on, onto, um, onto maps. And they, they are very, becomes a very useful tool for sort of having dialogues with senior managers. I mean, in another context, tell me a story about how decisions get made in this organization. And, um, you, um, and then you, having plotted them onto maps, you can click on the dots you know, say that you know that's an interesting area, and it's a way of getting senior member, senior staff, you know, bringing your stakeholders into the room effectively because you can sort of explore the map and say, you know, what's going. You know, there's a whole cluster of stories down here, mm. um, and you know, what's going on here, and um, you can look at the stories, and in that way, it gives those senior members or the people with fixed views. An alternative, and, be, and because stories are much richer than you know traditional surveys, um, you you get a much richer picture, which is what you need in working with complex problems. It's been quite widely used. It's used in very wide. It's used a lot in the development sector and um, uh, it's sort of people like um, UNESCO and so on use, use it with refugees and those sorts of people. But it, it's about, it's how, I think it's how you get your stakeholders, the real frontline people that you're trying to find some way of helping um, or changing things for them. It's how you get them in the room. Mm. And I mean, you talked, to, I think we are absolutely correctly about why, how important it was to involve your frontline staff who are the ones that are actually closest to the people that you're working with and yeah that's another technique but i think it is because often senior management you know my experience you know have a very distorted view you know they've been parachuted into the organization they have no experience on the front line um if they want to you know they want a big impressive project mm -hmm. to to sort of that they can show off sorry i'm talking too much no that's great richard that's that's fantastic Kathy, I hope that's uh, really useful. Oh, I hope there's some use in that. Um. I maybe have some. Uh, I mean, I think the the problem when when working in organization is that the the business that the people that are in the organization either just do one role and uh, just uh, focus on that role, and then everybody kind of gets what should be the most important role. 
and then they cannot do the customer journey or they cannot, uh, they don't know systems enough. I think the, the problem is for people working in public organizations and uh, even in private organizations is that they don't know what is actually possible in the systems, the, the cloud-based systems we have, even Google Mail and uh, Google Calendar is just uh, quite advanced tools actually. But if they don't know how they can exploit it, uh, towards their own role in the organization, then they are actually, uh, then they don't know how to design a process that's basically two way from the authority to the citizen. And uh, that is the problem. I think they, that these administrators don't know technology or cloud-based mm. systems enough. Or, or on the other hand, you have developers and software people <clears throat> that knows the cloud systems, but they don't know, do they don't know the organization and how the organization works. So, so this is why I argue for using both lean uh, startup uh, as you are doing also, but, uh, but also making sure that the technical people actually try to meet the lean people, so to speak. So I, I talk about IT being agile and I talk about uh, the organization being lean and but oftentimes you get you get just that they say the organization says, oh, we are agile because our IT people are agile. Mm. But that's not enough. Yeah. Uh, you have to make the organization lean also. And in between we have UX in my opinion. So uh, so so you have to have both agile and lean uh, knowledge inside the same organization. And if you don't, you are just administering people, uh, even in organizations and public sector. But, uh, but they also need to improve the IT systems. We all know that. But it has to come from the business organizational side. Yes. And I think, Bjarne, you just one thing I'd like to add to that, and I also I now remember it comes back to Richard's uh, point as well about adoption of uh, to new things. Um, so if you're in a role where you're trying to get change in your organization to take on, say, design sprints or take on technological change, or you're trying to launch a new product for users outside, the people that you're trying to serve, um, there's a very, very um, great book uh, called Crossing the Chasm, which is kind of like a classic, um, which looks at the technic technological adoption life cycle. It's called a life cycle, but it's basically that bell curve um, of adoption of things. And right down at the very, very front, you've got people who love innovation. So these are the people, um, if you're going to get the book, you don't need to read all the book. You just read the first like, first couple of chapters and it gives you what you need in terms of what I'm talking about. But you have people who like playing with a new thing just because it's new. So you've got people who, no matter how hard it is and how difficult it is to do, they will play with the 3D goggles or they will um, explore this new bit of software or use, use this new online tool or whatever it may be. Um, just because it's new and that's what they enjoy and then after that you've got the uh the, after those innovators you've got the um the adopters and these are the people who will do it so if you're trying to introduce change they will do it and they will embrace it if it's clear what the practical benefit is to them so between those two points you have to make a slight change in the way that you're selling it within the organization uh, or selling it to users so you've got your early niche of innovators then you've got the early adopters and then after that you've got this uh, this early majority, I think it's called. And these are the people who will um, do it, who will like take up a new thing. They will get a, uh, a, an electric car, for instance, if they see that um, it's of practical benefit and lots of other people are doing it and um, the, there is some support in place to get them started with it. And so like, again, we, and this is where the, the chasm comes in, like making that jump from the, the first two groups to that third group, the early majority, to changing the way that you pitch things to them and sell ideas. You have to make it clear that this is the way forward. Everyone's doing it. And these are the, this is the, the support that you will get if you want to make that transition as well. And then after that, you go down the other bell curve and you've got people who are like holding on for dear life that they don't want to do it. And we have to give them loads and loads and loads and loads of handholding. So, um, if you are trying to get some, um, thank you, thank you, uh, Jan. Um, if you are if you are trying to uh, uh, in, launch a new product, say, you have to think when it's out there, you're going to appeal to very early people, but then you're going to have to evolve the product and keep more support to people 
and show them how to do things, more handholding to get other people on uh, to use it. And if you're trying to introduce a change, like let's all do design sprints, it's the same thing. You're going to get people who are really up for it because it's new. And then you get people down the bell curve who want a lot of support and handholding and reassurance. Um, thank you. Uh, we're a few minutes over. I think we've got maybe time for one more question and then I think we should probably um, wrap up. Yeah, I agree much. It's about uh, what roles they play and, and how much they actually dare to go out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Well, maybe just on the subject of the BR, you know, you've just been talking about of how to bring about change in, in sort of conservative organisations. I've recently come across um, Mary Orbean, who's a professor in the States, and she talks about adaptive spaces, which sit between the entrepreneurial area of an organization where you've got, you know, people are generating ideas and the production area where you've got the sort of business as usual stuff going on. And, um, you know, she's got a whole range of really interesting ideas about how you take a sort of, a, a, you know, an idea from that entrepreneurial space and how you sort of transition it through this adaptive space. And one of the interesting things she talks about, which really resonated for me, is this idea of conflicting and connecting. That you know, when you try and introduce a new idea, it's inevitable that you're going to get tension. Mm -hmm. um, and rather than you know, historically in sort of um, top-down organizations, the tendency is to try and you know, drive that away. Um, mm. But out of that tension and conflict, you can actually change the idea. You can create, you know, and certainly some of the best things I think have happened to me have been around in situations where there have been arguments um, and conflict. And then, you know, out of that, you find a solution that is actually mm. better than any of the solutions that were previously on the table. So I think, um, I mean, she's doing a lot of work in the NHS, which is where I've sort of come, you know, because they're trying to sort of drive innovation. Um, but it, it recognizes that innovating is, is, is difficult, you know, particularly when you're working with people who've got a day job yeah. and, you know, and, and um, are already under a lot of pressure. And, yeah, they have ways that work at the moment, albeit flawed. Um, you know, how do you bring about change in that sort of production environment? Um, what was the, the name, Richard? Um, I'll see if I can find Mary Albean. Um, uh, Mary as in Mary, all U -H H L and B I E N. Um, see if I can. She, there's a whole. If you Google her, there's some very interesting talks she's been giving to a, a group of innovators in the NHS called I think the Q Group or something. Very well. Yeah, you know, I found them really exciting um, in terms of um, a way of thinking about how you bring about change in complex organ you know in complex situations and complex organizations and recognizing that it's not going to happen overnight you know and it, it, I mean the other thing about another principle for working with complex problems is sort of understand where people are and yeah. see what you can change easily you know that trying to, to you know taking small steps it's much easier to take and and complex systems have um, propensity, you know, they will more easily go in one direction than another and having some understanding about, you know, if we do this, then people are more likely to accept it than if we do that, there is going to be a lot of resistance to it and sometimes actually taking a, a circuitous route mm. to achieve your final outcome, you know, take somebody uh, and again, the um, the storytelling thing. I've can you know I can talk more about that. But it, it's you know that some if you understand where people are, and again, how do you get more stories like this and fewer like that? You know, the stories give you clues as to where people are comfortable. And you know, if you've got stories of some innovative things going on, you can look at those and use those to generate ideas in terms of how you can move you know, all these other stories that you, know, you, you really don't want to be happening in terms of people being unhappy or, or whatever, you know, how you can potentially move them from that space into, into another space. Thank you. Cheers, Richard. Okay, uh, I'm going to sorry. I'm, I'm, no, it's I'm, really good. It's all good. It's all gravy. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, Google that. I, I put. I think I captured the spelling right on the chat. I'll, I'll let's see if I can find the link. Okay. Um, here we go. Whilst we're doing that, Maddie, are you going to? You'd like to say something? Yeah. 
Uh, no, just want to say thanks to everyone, really. I've shared, reshared the questionnaire, and I know some people already filled that in, so thank you so much. Welcome, everybody, to this our second webinar. Sorry. With I'm just sorry. I just drew. I'm just putting a. Um, um, oh, oh, thank you. you. Okay. Oh, great. That's pretty... Can I just ask uh, how, how is the the the, the UK government uh, NHS and or what is it called the the the, the digitalization task force? Are they, are they using your tools or what are they doing? Uh, because I'm trying to find out in Denmark what they are actually using. I don't know. Do you mean? Do you mean NHS X? Yeah. And that's the kind of innovation what is labs, I think. Yeah, NHS is that your digitalization task force? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. There's the gov, the gov, ah, um, oh, uh, what's it called? The design, gov design thing. Yeah, the gov, exactly. Gov.uk, and they've got their design principles on, on their website somewhere. If you Google gov.uk, um, and I think you'll find it. Yeah, tedious, no. right? You call it tedious, what? Oh, I don't know. I uh, the government uh, digital services, tedious, yeah. Digital services, that's Government awesome. digital services, because I know Martin who works there. Uh, um, and I'm just still curious how, how he uses design sprints actually, like you have been presenting. And actually because he comes from Berlin and, and I have been uh, together with him in Berlin so I'm I'm uh, curious about uh, how how far the government is actually in using design sprints because it's also very very difficult for me to see in Denmark how far they are. They just have hired three four UX designers, but in my opinion, that's not enough. Yeah, yeah they have that quite big team, don't they? Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, to be honest. If you find out anything, that'd be great if you could um, uh, share it. Um, did, yes, equally, yeah. equally. Um, um, if you would like to like keep on, as Richard had that suggestion of uh, keeping on communication about complex problems and uh, being aware of like the impacts and, and changing the, the situation uh, for people, please do share your email address in the chat. That'd be grand. Um, and apart from that, I would like to say thank you so much to everyone for coming. It was really, really. I learned a huge amount, and I wish we could keep on talking for another hour. So um, it's really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Well, I hope you have a lovely day. If you um, are interested in a design sprint uh, of even a one day like variety, please let us know and we can keep keep talking. Uh, but otherwise, just please share with us what you're doing. We'd love to see it. And uh, I hope you have a lovely afternoon. OK. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you, everyone. See you at the next workshop. <laughs> Thank you for today. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm gonna. Are you gonna end, Richard? The call. Uh, I'll keep the call open so I can copy some of these things out of the chat for a few minutes. If that's okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay.